Well, let's turn to God's holy word and uh, turn to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. I want to begin a two-part sermon I've called In Addition. And I think as you read the, the word uh, of, of uh, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7, you'll see where I got my thought. Because Peter calls those to whom he writes to add to their faith. Add to their faith. There's always an addition, a development, uh, a continued transformation that comes when God touches us with His healing gospel. You may remain seated, but follow along. 2 Peter 1 verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. I like the story of the mother who was startled and awakened during the night by the cry of her little girl. And as she rushed into her child's bedroom, she found the child sprawled out on the floor, crying. She immediately scooped the, ba- the child up in her arms and asked, what happened? The little girl replied, I guess I fell asleep too close to where I got in. Now, something similar can happen to those who come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once inside the door of salvation, they stay there. Once inside the door of salvation, they stay there. They fail to recognize that coming to Christ invariably and immediately involves coming after Christ. We come to Him, and then we begin to follow Him. That's the biblical pattern of discipleship. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, you know what? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not a one-time deal. Exercised at the point of conversion. No, it's more than that, gloriously more than that. It's an everyday affair expressed in daily dependence upon Christ. It's not that you believe in Jesus and that's where it ends. You keep on believing in Jesus more and more and more. In fact, the just, right? Those who have put faith alone in Christ alone and they've received the gift of God's righteousness, the just, those who have been justified, declared acceptable and righteous before God through Jesus Christ, the just shall live by faith. The just became just by faith alone, but now they live by faith. As John Calvin said, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It's a continuing faith. Romans 1, 17, the, the just shall live by faith and go from faith to faith. According to the New Testament, the true Christian has a living faith, not a dead faith, right? Faith that doesn't grow. Faith in Jesus Christ that's not transformative is dead and spurious. Isn't that the thesis of the book of James, where James tells us in James uh, uh, 2 verse 17 that faith without works is dead? If you profess a faith in Jesus Christ that doesn't bring about a transformed life, that doesn't bring about a daily dependence upon Him, where we begin to take His character in our character, then that faith is dead. It's not true. It's the faith of demons who believe but are not changed by what they believe. No, faith in the New Testament is living, transformative, powerful, ongoing. I I think of Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7. Having received the Lord Jesus Christ. there's, There's salvation, right? That's the moment you come to faith. For me, that was the 20th of January, 1978, about quarter to nine at Antrim Road Baptist Church in Northern Ireland. Having received the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Walk in him. Rooted, built up, and established in faith. What about Galatians 2 verse 20? I'm crucified with Christ, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Having quoted Calvin, let me quote Luther, right? Calvin said, we're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It's faith alone in Christ that justifies us, but the just will live by faith. And here's what Martin Luther said himself, a champion of sola fide. He said, faith is a living, busy, active, powerful thing. It's impossible for it not to do us good continually. It never asks whether good works are to be done, but has done them before there is time to ask the question. And it is always doing them. See, faith brings us into a vital relationship with Christ, and as we abide in Christ, according to Christ, we bear fruit. Things are added to our faith in Christ. All things pass away, all things become new. And that's what's going on in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 7, which we're about to look at this morning and next Sunday morning. We started a series just a few weeks ago, Things You Need to Know. Because in 2 Peter, one of the key words is knowledge. I think it's used in various forms some 16 times in this letter. Peter wants you to know about Christ. He wants you to know what it means to know Christ and how you can grow in your knowledge of Christ. In chapter 1, he wants us to know about our faith. In chapter 2, he wants us to know about our foes. And in chapter 3, he wants us to know about our future. And in chapter 1 here, he takes up this theme of living by faith, of of growing in our faith and and trust in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Okay, you've put your faith in Jesus. You've come into a vital relationship with him. Now as as you work that out and live that out, you're going to add to your faith. Your knowledge of Christ and your experience of Christ and your service for Christ is going to develop and mushroom. In fact, what you have here in verse 5 of chapter 1, add to your faith, is just another way of saying what he says in chapter 3, verse 18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Add to your faith. In fact, it's interesting. Look at verses um, 2 through 5, and you'll see that Peter wants multiplication, right? Look at verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied. You and I have come to know God's grace, God's unmerited favor through Jesus Christ, and it has brought us into a relationship with God where we have peace with God. That's where it all started. Faith in Christ brought peace with God. But, it, but that grace and that peace can be multiplied. We can, go from the peace, the, we can go from peace with God to the peace of God. And we can experience God's grace in an ever-increasing fashion, right? John 1.16, of his fullness have we received grace upon grace, grace after grace, grace replacing grace. He not only uh, desires multiplication, he desires subtraction. A person has come to Christ as a person at the end of verse 4 who has escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Apart from God's grace and apart from Christ, you and I live the life in a world marked by human desire apart from God's glory. And we put that behind us now, that we subtract that from our life and we add faith and obedience and love for Jesus. Multiplication, subtraction, addition. Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Peter wants him to grow, wants him to develop. I I like uh, the story that the late Ray Steadman told about asking a young boy how old he was, and quick as a flash, the little fella said, well, I'm 12, going on 13, soon to be 14. (laughs) The kid wanted to grow up, and Peter wants these believers to grow up. Okay, you've come to faith, great, let's move on. 
You realize that salvation is a spectrum of things? It's justification, sanctification, glorification. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. You are presently being saved from the dominion of sin. Someday in heaven, you'll be saved from the very temptation and desire to sin. And faith understands that spectrum. Faith understands that it's faith alone in Christ that justifies. But having been justified, we're now going to practice the righteousness that God has given us as a gift. And that's where Peter's at here. Now, let me put this text in its context quickly. What role are these verses playing? Well, as we've said, chapter 1 deals with Peter developing their faith, coming to a greater understanding, number one, of the sure foundation upon which their faith is founded, the Word of God, that more sure word of prophecy will get there. And he wants them to make their calling and election sure. He doesn't want them to stumble, and he doesn't want them to fall short of all that God has for them. He wants them to know, you know what? When you got saved, when you put your initial faith in Jesus Christ, at that moment, God gave you in Christ everything you need for life and godliness. So draw on Christ's sufficiency by faith through grace and develop a robust relationship with Christ. Express true faith, which is based upon the true foundation of God's Word. Now, when you get to chapter 2, he's going to deal with false teachers and false theology. They have a spurious faith. Their behavior is not biblical. It's immoral, greedy, and sexual. Their, their theology is aberrant. It's not based on the sure foundation of God's Word. And so before he gets there, I think Peter is realizing, you know what the best antidote for false faith is? True faith. And so he gets them ready. He, he kind of heads the false teachers off at the pass. That's kind of where we're at. So three things here. If you're taking notes, we'll cover uh, two in a bit this morning. The deduction the diligence, the development. The deduction, the develop, the, sorry, the deduction, the diligence, the development. The deduction. Look at verse 5. You'll see the conjunction, but it's tied this verse and these verses to the previous verses, certainly verses 3 and 4. And so this call to add to one's faith, this call to deepen one's discipleship is a natural outworking of the sufficiency of Christ. You see, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have gospel promises which are exceeding and great, and if we believe them, we're going to live a robust Christian life. Now, given that reality, given what we have in Christ, here's the deduction. Do you realize what you have? And when you realize what you have, you can become more than you are add to your faith. You see, faith lays hold of Christ, and in laying hold of Christ comes to see the abundance of Christ's person and work, and therefore desires to know Him more, show Him more, grow in Him more. Maybe I could borrow the words from Paul in Philippians 3, verses 12 to 4. What does Paul say? I have not yet grasped, laid hold of, or apprehended all that Jesus gra grabbed me for and apprehended me for. Therefore, if you're getting those things which are behind, I press forward. I want more of Him. I want to understand the full spectrum of salvation. I'm justified, but Jesus didn't lay hold of me just to justify me. Jesus laid hold of me to, 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 to change me into His likeness, to live a life according to the will of God and, and, and a life that advances God's kingdom in the world. And I want, to, I want to lay hold of that reality. There's grace for that. There's help for that. Therefore, I'm pressing forward. From I'm justified. I want to be more sanctified as I wait to be glorified. You get that thought? So here's the point. Given the ocean of God's blessings in Christ, all things pertaining to a godly life, faith is not satisfied to paddle around the edges of God's saving purpose. Faith is not satisfied to just stand inside the door of salvation. But for this reason, give all diligence to the development of your faith. God's got plans for you 
God's got glorious promises for you. Now go and live it, develop it, enjoy it, enter into it. So the compelling and clarifying reason behind the call to add virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance to faith is this. Since we have in Christ all things pertaining to a godly life, since we have the grand promise of participation in the divine nature, let's get about the business of living a life that reflects God's work in us and Christ's worth to us. Here's the reason you ought to add to your faith. You have everything you need in Christ to add to your faith. Here's the question that comes out of this to make it practical. What are you doing with what you have? See, that's kind of the, that's what implied here. Peter's kind of saying, in other words, what are you doing with what you have? You've got all things pertaining to life and godliness. You've got all things necessary to live a robust Christian life, a life of overcoming So what are you doing with what you have? Are you adding to your faith? God doesn't want you to stumble. You'll see that in verses 9, 10, 11. We'll get there. God doesn't want you to be short-sighted about his saving purposes in you. God wants you to be sure that you're saved, and God wants you someday, verse 11, to enter into his kingdom abundantly. So what are you doing with what you have? You have a sufficiency in Christ and a treasure trove of gospel promises that allows you to do all the things that God has promised to you and planned for you. You need to hear this this morning. You have in Christ what it takes to get where God wants you to be and God wants what what God wants you to do. Or let me put it another way, just simply. You have what it takes to be a great Christian. You have what it takes to be a great Christian. Every one of us, from pulpit to pew, pew to pulpit, we all have been given the things necessary to live a godly life. Every one of us, that's our birthright. Jesus is sufficient, and the Word of God is sure, and the Spirit of God is active. So what are you doing with what you have? Are you subtracting? Are you multiplying? Are you adding? That's the point here. You have the God-given resources to cultivate a spiritual life. Do you appreciate how great your resources actually are? They're so great that you can keep adding and keep multiplying and keep subtracting. Maybe if we were to kind of draw an analogy you know, where, where Peter's kind of driving at, at, at this issue of, you know what, do you understand what you have? Are you, are you drawing from those resources. I mean, uh, in my home and here in the church office, I've got all sorts of high-tech products. The church is kind and and the elders underwrite what our pastors need to work effectively. We've got Apple products, computers, and phones. I can assure you my one, whatever it is, Apple 23 or 24, whatever it is, I can guarantee you I'm using about 5% of its capacity you know what, I could just as well work with a, a, one of those flip phones, <laughs> basically. That, that thing's, it, it's a Rolls Royce. It's, it's a Maserati of technology, and I'm, 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 I'm driving it, you know, uh, you know, l- like it's a Yugo. <laughs> I have it, but I'm not sure I have resourced it. And Peter's kind of at that right now. Now, here's what you have. Do you understand what you have in Christ? All things that pertain to godliness. Now, what are you doing with it? I hope you're adding to your faith. I hope you're developing in your discipleship. Because here's what we have in Christ. I borrowed this from an, uh, uh, um, um, an unknown writer. Here's what we have in Christ. A love that can never be fathomed a life that can never die, a righteousness that can never be tarnished, a peace that can never be understood, a joy that can never be diminished, a hope that can never be disappointed, a glory that can never be clouded, a light that can never be darkened, a happiness that can never be enfeebled, a purity that can never be defiled, a beauty that can never be marred, a wisdom that can never be baffled, and we have resources that can never be exhausted. That's what we have. 
So why are you and I living below power? Why are we a victim of the world rather than a conqueror through Christ? It's because we're not drawing on the resources that are ours. This will require diligence and dedication. I just finished a book this week, Robert Morgan's book, Jordan River Rules. I don't know if you've read his earlier book, Red Sea Rules. I think we give it away through our reading ministry. It's a wonderful little book. And this is a follow-up book where he looks at Joshua 1, 2, and 3, and the children of Israel cover, crossing the River Jordan, and he's drawn some things that are helpful for him because his wife, who had struggled with MS for many years, just passed away in 2019. Now he's crossing over into a new chapter and stage in his life, and God gave him encouragement through this passage. And in the book, he quotes um, an old professor at Columbia University in South Carolina, and the professor said this, all there is of God is available to the person who is available to all there is of God. That's a good statement. Peter would agree with that. In fact, Peter's kind of driving at this. All there is of God and God's grace, all the things necessary for life and godliness, they're available to the man who's available to all there is of God's grace. But the question is, are you available? The question is, am I pursuing these resources? I'm holding on to Christ like I hold on to my high-tech cell phone, but am I truly resourcing Christ in all His sufficiency? Having quoted that, you've got to tell the story of Moody. 1873, he's in Dublin, Ireland. D.L. Moody was a, the Billy Graham of his day. He ended up founding the Moody Bible College in Chicago. He was in a prayer meeting. He spent all night in prayer with several men. And at the end of it, a, a British evangelist named Henry Varley uttered these life-changing words, quote, The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly concentrated, consecrated to him. It's kind of a take on those words, right? All there is of God is available to the person who's available to all there is of God. And those words hung around Moody's neck for several weeks until on a bended knee, he said, Lord, I desire to be that man. Um, I, I know there's an abundance of grace that will allow me to abundantly serve you. So that's the deduction for this reason, add your, to your faith, because you can, out of the sufficiency of Christ. But let's look at the diligence. The diligence, growth in grace, continuing faith in Jesus Christ requires the grace of God, okay? It always starts with God. God is the antecedent and the sovereign mover of all spiritual activity in my life. It is God that opens my eyes. It is God that awakens my heart. It is God who brings me to the point of faith and by His gift enables me to trust Him. It's all God. His divine power has given to us all things. But there's a balance. God is the antecedent of all spiritual activity, but you and I must cooperate with God in our relationship with Jesus Christ because there must be grace from God, but there also must be grit from us. Because notice, after God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, right? Verse 3, we're to give all diligence to add to our faith. He gives, and in response, we give ourselves to what He has given The development of our walk with God necessitates diligence on our part. You will not become automatically or easily a robust disciple of Jesus Christ. It just won't happen. You can stand with your hands held high for a weekend in an act of worship and still not be sanctified, still not be a deeper disciple of Jesus Christ. That, that's certainly a wonderful act 
but it's going to require diligence in your part. It's going to require effort on your part. It's going to require some things on your part. Sanctification, growing in our faith, is not passive, it's active. Justification is passive. It's something God does for us, apart from us, through the alien righteousness of Jesus Christ, grace to us. It's, it's monergistic. It's something God does alone. But once we've been made alive, once we've been regenerated, once the Holy Spirit is operative in our lives, we now, with, with faculties made alive by the grace of God, must cooperate, must contribute to all that God is doing in making us more like the Lord Jesus, making us a, a, a better disciple of Him. Let me give you a couple of verses that I think will help with that. Uh, what about Philippians 2? Write this down. I'll read it for you. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. I think you've got this wonderful balance. And again, listen to the order. Listen to who does what in what order. Philippians 2, verse 12, Paul says to them, Therefore, my beloved, as you have also obeyed, not as much in my presence only, but as much more in my absence, work out your salvation. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said work out your salvation. It's a possession by grace. But now that you're saved, then dwell by the Holy Spirit, God's got a spectrum of purposes in His life and your life. You've got to work that out with fear and with trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and do His good pleasure. So God saves you, God works in you, and as God works in you and you submit to that, you work out what He's working in. Similar language in Colossians 1, verses 28 to 29. Listen to these words. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. To this end I labor. Paul's hard at work discipling and pastoring the church in Colossae. To this end I labor, striving. That's all words of energy, commitment, diligence. According to his working, which works in me mightily. You see, we are to respond to what God is doing in us. Sanctification is not easy, nor is it automatic. You've got to give effort in prayer, Bible study, fellowship, allowing someone to mentor you and applying their lessons. The Bible is at pains to point out that a lazy spirit is a losing spirit. I know it, I'm not saying it's the whole answer or the whole story, but my guess is, based on this text and in your life or in my life, when things are sluggish, when things aren't going well, when our walk with God isn't where it needs to be, one of the aspects is we're lazy. We're just lazy. A lazy spirit is a losing spirit. Peter says, hey, I don't want you stumbling. I don't want you living with a lack of assurance. I want you entering into God's kingdom someday and hearing the well done, and that's going to take effort where you respond to what God is doing in your life. In fact, let me, let me show you this. Just reinforce this. It takes effort to escape the clutches of the world. It takes effort to grow in grace. It takes effort, gospel-sponsored effort, grace-based effort, but effort nonetheless to labor for Christ fruitfully. It takes effort to enter the kingdom of God in the enjoyment of eternal rewards. While human effort is subordinate, it is nevertheless significant and necessary. Let me show you. Look at the word giving. Giving all diligence. Um, that part, that's a participle that conveys the idea of applying yourself to, or interestingly, bringing to bear alongside something. So, so Peter's actually saying, you need to bring alongside what God is doing, effort. You've got to wrestle in prayer. You've got to study the Word of God in an unashamed manner. You've got to pursue Christian fellowship even at a cost. You've got to submit yourself to pastors and mentors and allow them to coach you. You've got to bring alongside God's grace this effort. You've got to cooperate with grace through the means of grace. Right? Let grace and peace be multiplied. 
How, how is grace multiplied? The means of grace. Prayer, fasting, Bible study, fellowship, mentoring. Look at the word diligent. Giving all diligence. It's a word that carries the idea of eager, zealous. Are you an eager and zealous Christian? You know? Do you need to be kind of cooled down or warmed up? This is the opposite of lazy and sluggish. Now, the word odd is the most interesting. Maybe your translation puts supply to your faith virtue, which would be a good translation. This is a, an interesting and, dis, and distinct word. It, it carries the idea of an abundant contribution. If you go back into the Greek world of the time of Paul's, Peter's writing, in order to keep public spending to a minimum, there's a crazy idea. <laughs> Wealthy men were sometimes expected to personally contribute something to public works. That might mean a contribution to some stage production, for example, to the building of a battleship for the nation's security. But the word carried the idea of a lavish contribution on the part of a benefactor. And it was called adding. And that's the word that Peter uses. And he's, he's saying, look, God is lavishly investing in your life, underwritten by grace. And then response, you're to lavishly contribute effort in the outworking of your salvation. Discipleship requires diligence, right? Scroll down to verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Scroll down to verse 15, and he is speaking about himself. Moreover, I will be careful or diligent to ensure that you're always in, in remembrance of these things after my death. Scroll to Chapter 3, verse 14, speaking about the second coming. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and, ble and, and, and blameless. Diligence, effort, working out what God is working in. I love what, what um, D.A. Carson says. People do not drift towards holiness. Have you noticed that? You ever get up in the Monday morning and you're just pursuing Christ? You haven't given any thought to it and any effort. It just comes automatically. Never. <laughs> or if it's happening, you're in a dream and you'll waken up and you'll see it's never. <laughs> people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. And there is true legalism, by the way. I'm off script now. Where you're depending upon your own works and your own efforts to kind of win some favor or grace from God. That's pure legalism, but... Giving yourself strenuously to spiritual disciplines, that's not legalism. Setting the clock for five o'clock in the morning so that you get some time in the Word before the day rushes on, that's not legalism. Setting times of prayer and, and giving yourself to sequential, systematic study of God's Word, that's not legalism. That's diligence. And you need it, and I need it, because none of us drift towards holiness 1, T 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, train yourself to be godly. Huh. In his book, The Disciplines of a Godly Man, that's the message that our Kent Jews takes up, and he calls it holy sweat. If you and I are going to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to spill some holy sweat. We need to, with all diligence, add to our faith. In fact, when R. Kent Hughes was here at Kindred Community Church at our men's retreat, he made that statement that the Christian life requires inglorious discipline. All right? It's much easier if you get a word from the Lord than having to work your way through the book of Ezekiel or learn the book of Leviticus. 
No. Sanctification, growth in grace, requires inglorious discipline. Away from the spotlight, away from the emotion of collective worship, where you give yourself diligently to the pursuit of Christ and the means of grace. No sweat, no sainthood, no discipline, no discipleship. That's what R. Kent Hughes reminded us. The, the, the illustration I'm about to share, it runs the risk of, 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 of seeming, you know, uh, improper uh, and almost, uh, you know, irreverent. But, but it's not intended that way. And I think if we understand that in the context of what we've just said, it makes a point. There's the story of a, of a pastor who, who um, had a little piece of ground outside the city that he was working on over time. It needed a lot of work. The house was dilapidated. The, 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 you know, there was old um, tree stumps and the soil had gone fallow. And over, over every Saturday for many years, he worked on it part-time. And over time, the garden blossomed and the house was repaired. And, and towards the end and heading towards his own retirement, a neighbor said to him one day, well, preacher, you and God have some, some, done some great work here. To which the preacher replied, that's true, but you should have seen the place when God had it to himself. Now, now, in one sense, that seems irreverent. <laughs> but in another sense, it reminds us, in the book of Genesis, God put Adam into the garden to tend it, to work alongside the Creator in subduing the creation for God's glory. And the marvelous thing about the purpose of salvation is that God invites us to serve alongside Him and you and I must do that with effort and diligence. Let's begin with this third thought of the development. We'll only, we've only got a few minutes, but I'll, we'll get the first trait or virtue in. So we've seen the deduction, right? For this reason, given all that God has given to you, you need to give yourself diligently to the pursuit of Christ and add to your faith. Then we've seen the diligence required. Now I want you to see the development, add to your faith. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. God wants to see those things in your life and my life. And when you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, that those things will begin over time to appear as we diligently with effort submitting to God's grace, allow the Spirit of God to produce that in our lives. In verse 2, Peter has called for a symphony of grace to be operational. And in verses 5 through 7, he, he sees the outworking of that symphony with a harmony of seven virtues added to the melody line of faith. They're to go from faith to faith. Now, what we have here is, is Christian character development. Well, maybe look at this a little more, more next week, maybe not, but just to, you know, stir your thinking. It's, this list is not unlike the fruit of the Spirit, and there are other several lists in the New Testament. This is just a list of, uh, 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 not, not exhaustive, but, but selective of, of uh, spiritual fruit, of, of character development in the life of a man or woman who's being transformed by God's grace. And these fruits these traits, these virtues will be present, right? Because faith without works is dead. If these things aren't present in your life to some degree or any degree, you got a question if you're in the faith. That's the whole purpose of verse 10. You want to make your calling and election sure? Well, at least on the subjective side of things, take a look. Is your life being transformed by the present working of God in your life? It's plural and progressive. In fact, the grammar of these verses would teach us that each trait, each fruit, or each um, virtue inspires and introduces the other. I don't want you seeing it like a string of pearls, as one of the commentators puts it, or some to-do list that you just work sequentially through. No, the, these, are, these are aspects of Christian character. In fact, this is a description of Jesus, isn't it? Self-controlled, persevering, loving, virtuous, no, no, these, these virtues will be present, and they'll be plural, 
and they'll be progressive. Now, I'm glad of that. They'll, they'll develop simultaneously. All these things should be being developed in our life all at once, but it won't be even and it won't be equal. You know, sometimes my knowledge will be stronger than my perseverance and so on and so forth. And, and again, depending where you are, this certainly should be more developed and more equal if you've been on the road of discipleship for quite some years, you know? I hope that your experience with Christ is 25 years and not one year 25 times. I hope you've added to your faith, knowledge. You've developed in your character. You're not as surly and impatient as you used to be. You're more gracious and loving. But, but a young Christian, well, they're not going to be there so quickly, and so it's going to be uneven given time and circumstances. And I appreciate that. In, in, in fact, if I can find it, um, I, have a, I have a quote here. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, he thought about that and realized, you know what? When I'm dealing with my congregation and encouraging them to grow in grace, especially maybe in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, I've got to remember where I'm at as a mature believer and where they're at as a new Christian and be somewhat understanding. He says this, I have been 30 years forming my own theological views and in the course of this time, some of my hills have sunk and some of my valleys have risen. But how unreasonable would it be to expect all this should take place in another person in the course of a year or two? That's fair. So it's going to happen simultaneously, but not necessarily evenly, given the person, the time, the knowledge, the opportunities, and so on. And here's another thought before we quickly look at the first trait. If you go to chapter 3 and verse 11, when he's speaking about the second coming of Jesus, he asks a question. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? You want an answer to that question? What does holy conduct look like? Verses 5 through 7 in chapter 1. That's the kind of person we ought to be as we await the second coming of Jesus. So let's look at this chain of virtues just quickly. Number one, and we'll pick this up next Sunday morning, God willing. Add to your faith virtue. Virtue. Now in verse 3, this same Greek word is used to describe the moral beauty of Jesus' life. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus. And you'll see he has given us divine power for all things pertaining to life through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. One of the things that attracted us to Jesus was the attractiveness of Jesus. No man ever spoke like this man. How beautiful was he in word and in deed. So that's what this word means. It means excellence, moral beauty. Now, I want to step back quickly and then reconnect and we'll be done. But when you go into a word study, especially the, 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 the Greek world, they loved this idea of virtue or excellence. They strived, the Greeks did, to be virtuous and excellent. And the word itself that Peter's using here is a word that means the proper fulfillment of something. It's something that has achieved its purpose and end. So the Greeks would say that a knife, if I can speak like this, a knife was virtuous and excellent because it cut cleanly. The Greek would say that a horse is virtuous and excellent because it ran fast and strong. And they would say that a singer was virtuous and excellent because they sang well. That's what it means to be virtuous, to be excellent. It means the proper fulfillment of the purpose of the thing being spoken of. It, it speaks of something that has lived up to its purpose. So let's think about that as we close. Add to your faith virtue and excellence. You could put it, add to your faith a life lived on purpose. But I want to reconnect it to the idea of Jesus' moral excellence because I've got one more verse for you. Write it down and I'll read it to you. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Here's what Peter says about the Christian's calling or the Christian's purpose. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You might have a translation where you proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light. It's the same Greek word. What's your purpose? Why did God save you? What's God's calling and destiny for you? It's to get up every day and let your life, your marriage, your recreation, your spending of money, your choices, your workplace, that becomes a platform to show forth the excellencies of Jesus. Will you reproduce Him in your language and in your deeds? See, we're made for Him and by Him. That's our purpose. I don't want my life to be conformed to social norms. I don't even want my life created around some personal goals. I want my life to become the purpose for which I was created. And one of those fundamental purposes is to proclaim the excellencies, the virtues of Jesus Christ. The excellence of a man It's found in the life patterned after the man, Christ Jesus, who was a man par excellence. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us he suffered, leaving us an example to follow. There's just one example. Peter wants us to live a virtuous life, which means patterning our life after the one who was most virtuous. That's our purpose. As we close and the team comes up, I hope you're living on purpose. I hope you know your purpose. Can I help you this morning? Because a lot of people, I don't know if you've noticed this, friends, family, everybody's on a journey to find themselves. I I hope they don't find themselves because they're going to be really disappointed when they find themselves. Everybody's on a journey to find themselves, and it's complete nonsense and balderdash. Your purpose in life has already been determined. You were made for His glory. You were made for His pleasure. And He saved you to proclaim the excellencies of His Son. Add that to your faith. Listen to Tony Evans in his book called On Purpose. Many people today are running here and there are trying to find themselves. This search is meaningless. If you don't know who you are, how do you know what you're looking for? And how do you know when you find you since you don't know what you're looking for? It makes complete sense to me. He goes on to say this, toasters don't find themselves, refrigerators don't find themselves, appliances don't find themselves because their purpose has been assigned by another. A toaster doesn't have to find its reason for existence. It just needs to do what the manufacturer made it to do. As a Christian... You don't have to look for yourself. God has already defined your purpose and described your destiny. Your purpose is to fulfill it. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so that you might show forth the excellencies and the virtues of Jesus Christ to which you were called. Don't find yourself, find Christ. And live in such a manner that others find Christ in you. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word this morning. This call to add to our faith. To multiply our experience of grace and peace. Oh Lord, that's, that's so exciting. That we have all that we need for a godly life. Grace is abundant but we need to give ourselves diligently to the means of grace, to enjoy grace. So help us to apply ourselves more fully to our Christian walk, more deliberately to our discipleship. We thank you this isn't pure self-effort. This isn't stoicism. This isn't us pulling up our proverbial socks. This is us allowing the Christ who lives in us to live out from the midst of us as we depend on him and give all diligence to pursuing him. With Paul, we pray this morning, O God, we have not yet laid hold of all that you have laid hold of us for. Therefore, forgetting those things which are behind, we press, we spill some holy sweat 
in adding to our faith virtue. Oh, Lord, thank you for clarifying our purpose. We don't leave this place this morning wondering why we're here and what this week is all about. We are called to go out into the midst of life and show forth the virtues and excellency of Jesus Christ. We can do that simply with words, proclaiming the gospel and talking about him, but that needs to be underwritten with a life that looks something like him. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.